Do you want to be a magic blasting Super Saiyan? How about a badass katana wielding samurai? Or would you rather slap your foes without even touching them? Why not all three? Or maybe something completely different like a Frost Spellblade or Sleep Assassin. Either way, this guide covers all of the upgrades needed for any of these builds so that you can have plenty of options to pick from while breezing through not only the mid game but also the end game with more ease. Especially for intelligence builds which includes the prisoner and astrologer classes, but even if you don't fit any of that criteria, this guide can also help you if you may want to try out sorcery later on at all too. Also, I know there has been a lot of changes with the latest 104 patch update, but thankfully everything I cover in this guide are still my top recommendations for becoming overpowered for intelligence builds. And as a last side note, if you are still in the early game of Elden Ring, then be sure you haven't missed anything from my first OP guide. But without further ado, let's start upgrading the crap out of everything. To start, be sure to level up as much as you want using this rune guide location if you haven't already. If you don't have access to this area, then feel free to check out this video that will walk you through it, but once you have access, you can farm about 13k runes every 10 seconds, which comes out to about 4.7 million runes in a hour. Just go to the same spot and watch the bird fall to its death, and you should be good to go. Now that we have leveled up a good bit, I would recommend getting my favorite Ash of War in the game next, the Bloodhound Step. Cannot recommend this Ash of War enough, especially for Spellblades and Magic users, given how useful it can be in dodging attacks and controlling how much distance you want to keep between enemies. Although the Knight's Cavalry boss that drops this Ash of War can be a bit challenging, I'm going to show you how to choose a fight to make it easy. For starters, once you get to this bridge in front of Lens Rice Tower at night time, just gallop past him and bait him into the poisonous traps up the hill on the other side of the bridge. Be sure to cure yourself of the poison if needed, but once he is poisoned, you should see his health continue to slowly tick down over time. He may teleport back to the bridge after following you, but either way, just bring him back to this part of the bridge where you can safely sit on top of a branch and cast spells to kill him faster. Now that he is defeated, you'll be able to quickly dodge up most attacks for a very low amount of FP consumption, so you could even use beefy armor sets like this for boss fights if you really wanted to. If you want to consider other Ashes of War though, then I'd recommend checking out Glintstone Pebble for anyone interested in running a crit build. It is sold by Sorcerer Ragier for 1500 runes, or can be purchased from the Twin Maiden Husk at the Round Table Hold by using Ragier's Bell Bearing. A great weapon to use for any of these Ashes of War is the Misericord Dagger. This can be looted off a corpse in Stormvale Castle that can be found in a large armory room after using a Stone Sword key, but it is well worth it given that this is the highest crit damage weapon in the game. If you are interested in a crit build, then the Sword of St. Trina is another good weapon to consider pairing with the dagger. Thankfully, this one is also easy to snag. It will require a Stone Sword key as well, but it is located in the Forsaken Ruins near the Rotview Balcony Site of Grace. This is one of the only sleep weapons in the game, so I highly recommend getting it, especially now that the 104 patch update has decreased the time it takes to use this weapon skill. If you want to play as a Mage Samurai, then you'll of course need to pick up the Moonveil Katana, which is dropped as a reward after defeating the Magma Wyrm boss at the end of the Gale Tunnel located within the Khaled region. As you can see, this thing not only packs a punch, but it can also break enemies' poise after just a couple of hits using the weapon's special attack, leaving them open for more critical hits. You can also hit enemies within a small range too if you want to keep a little bit of distance. If you'd rather glitter bomb your enemies to death, then the Wing of Astal is definitely the weapon for you. To get it, start at the Noxtella Eternal City Site of Grace, go toward the waterfall, climb up the ladder, go through the door, then up this path while hugging the right wall, and just drop down to this ledge to get to this chest and you should be good to go. Now that you have this weapon, you can use this Ash of War for a sparkling glitter bomb effect that will absolutely destroy any enemies in his path. It can also make enemies vulnerable to critical attacks once you get enough hits in too. The other unique aspect to this weapon is that its special attack can hit enemies at a small range without consuming any FP at all. So if you're concerned about FP consumption at any point in the game, then just spam the ranged attack on this weapon and you'll be set. If you want something that hits heavier, then you'll definitely want to check out the Dark Moon Greatsword. This bad boy can be found below the Cathedral of Manicellus after getting Rennie the Dark Moon Ring as part of her quest line. Once you have this weapon, you'll have yet another great option to use to deal some major damage, especially with the ranged attack it can do after charging the blade using its Ash of War, which provides additional frost buildup too. 
This was already a great weapon to begin with for any aspiring frost mages out there, but the 104 patch update has made it even better by not only increasing its frost buildup effect, but also increasing its cast speed while decreasing its FP cost and recovery time. As a FYI, if you don't already know, keep a lookout for any cave entrance icons on the map that have an orange highlight around them as they often include smithing stone minor ball bearings, which you can turn into the twins at the round table to buy smithing stones for upgrades, so definitely don't miss out on them. If you would rather spend your points in other skills aside from endurance, then I highly recommend the Raging Wolf armor set since it provides a good amount of defense while being lighter in weight to help keep you in that medium equip load range. To get it, you will need to obtain the second assassination quest from the Volcano Manor, which will have you go to the Lindale Royal Capital to assassinate two NPCs. Once they're defeated, it will be dropped as a reward and it should last you for all of mid-game, but once you spend enough points in other skills, just feel free to level up your endurance so you can wear whatever you want later on for endgame too. I know there are other helmets that can boost intelligence or mind as well, but it doesn't take long for them to become less relevant once you level up more. So the only other recommendation I have for armor is the Snow Witch Hat, since it boosts cold sorcery and can be easily found in a chest on the upper floor of Rena's Rise as part of Rainy's questline. If you prefer to fight with a shield, then be sure to snag the Carrion Knight shield if you haven't already since it is one of the few that scales with intelligence. It can be looted after defeating Moongrum, the Carrion Knight at Rey Lucaria Academy. However, if you don't mind spending some points to get strength up to 20, then a better shield to use would be the Jellyfish Shield. This one can be found on a broken wagon next to a corpse surrounded by four jellyfish directly north of the foot of the four belfries side of grace. The reason this shield is so good is because the special skill you can use with it causes a 20% increase to damage for 30 seconds, which can be huge for harder fights. If you're tired of running the same meteorite staff that I covered in my early game OP guide, then consider upgrading to the Carrion Regal Scepter. This is my overall go-to staff for the game given how much damage you can do with its sorcery scaling without using too much FP. It can only be obtained after defeating Renala by turning her Remembrance over to Inia at the round table hold, so if you need assistance with this fight, feel free to check out this boss fight guide. Another great option to have is the Lucette staff. This truly may be the most powerful staff overall in the game, but it also comes with an extra 50% cost for FP2, so I'd recommend saving this staff mainly to try to make boss fights shorter as long as you're not concerned about FP consumption too much. If you're interested, just head to Celia, the town of sorcery where it can be found in a chest north of the sorceress and priest boss duo's chamber after defeating them. There are lots of great spells in this game, so you'll never run out of options, but I know it can take a lot of experimenting to figure out which spells are more worthwhile, so I've put together this separate video that covers my top 19 recommended spells overall for the game. This includes map locations, demos, and how to get each of these 19 spells in their own separate YouTube chapters to make it easier to skip around for the spells that you're looking for. However, for general gameplay, I would recommend using the Carrion Slicer, Adola's Moonblade, Carrion Piercer, Glintstone Comet Shard, Loretta's Great Bow, and the Stars of Ruin. There are plenty of other good options to consider, like the Gavel of Hema and the Swift Glintstone Shard, but these are the main spells I find myself using the most for close and long-range encounters. For boss fights, I would recommend using Adola's Moonblade, Glintstone Comet Shard, Terra Magica, and Rani's Dark Moon or Comet Azure. These spells in particular have been consistently useful for boss fights, especially when coupled with the Bloodhound Step Ash of War to quickly create or close distance for countering with the right spell. Also, I know the 104 patch update made changes to a lot of sorcery spells, but they mostly all consisted of just increasing casting speed while decreasing recovery time. Adula's Moonblade was one of the only sorcery spells that was nerfed, but they only nerfed its first initial attack and buffed the rest of the spell to make its frost attack hit more consistently, so it's still my favorite spell to use overall. Also, there are two main crystal tiers I'd recommend getting for intelligence builds. The first one is the Magic Shrouding Crack tier, which boosts your magic attacks by 20% for 3 minutes, and can be obtained by defeating the Erdtree Avatar found in Liernia of the Lakes under the Minor Erdtree east of the Mausoleum Compound side of Grace. The next obvious tier recommendation is the Cerulean Hidden tier, which will give you an infinite amount of FP for a total duration of 15 seconds, which is great if you want to spam a bunch of spells at one time or Kamehameha your way out of any fights. This is dropped by an ulcerated tree spirit found by the Minor Ur Tree in Mount Gelmer, directly east of the Road of Inquiry Side of Grace. If you need additional memory stones to equip more spells, you can defeat the Red Wolf of Radagon and the Demi-Human Queen Maggie to snag two real quick. 
but see the description below for a more in-depth guide for memory stone locations if needed. There are a lot of great talismans in this game to consider using even after narrowing it down for intelligence builds. However, to help save some time, I've put together a separate location guide for the top 9 talismans that I recommend using for the builds covered in this video. Aside from obtaining these talismans, I'd also recommend getting your fourth and last talisman pouch by defeating Godfrey, the Golden Shade version of the first Elden Lord, who can be found in a room located at the top of the branches south of the Western Rampart capital site of Grace and the Lindell Royal Capital. Although the Mimic Tear used to be the top recommended spirit summon, it received a nerf a while back that caused it to no longer necessarily be the best one to use, especially for magic builds, so the current best option in my opinion is the Black Knife Tish, which is dropped by Electo, the Black Knife Ringleader, upon defeat at the Ringleader's Evergel in southwestern Lyurnia. It does require the most FP out of all other spirit summons, consuming a total of 132 FP, but it is well worth it given how much damage they can do while attacking very aggressively most of the time, so definitely a great option for 1v1 boss fights. If you ever feel outnumbered though, then be sure to get the Spartan Great Shield Soldiers, as they are what I'd consider the best group-based spirit summon in the game. Thankfully, they are easier to obtain since they are simply found on a corpse in a graveyard in Nokron, and they only consume 74 FP in comparison. Although Tish may be a better option for when the enemy uses more AoE attacks, these guys will often surround and stun lock opponents, making fights completely laughable at times. Once you've leveled up a good bit, you'll probably want to consider respecking at some point, especially now that the 104 patch update increased the FP growth rate at lower levels. Either way, I'd recommend leveling up Intelligence to at least 60 overall so you can use the Common Azure and most other spells, but Renala's Moon spell will require 70 Intelligence, and Rani's Dark Moon spell requires 68 Intelligence, so you could use that instead if you want to use the extra points to get Vigor up to 40 to avoid getting one-shotted, and Mind up to level 23, which is just enough to summon the Black Knife Tish Spirit. Likewise, you'll want Strength up to 12 for the Moonveil Katana, 16 for the Dark Moon Greatsword, and 20 if you want to use the Jellyfish Shield. I'd also highly recommend leveling up your Endurance enough to ensure you can stay at a medium equipment load to avoid fat rolling at all. You can always sacrifice some defense for lighter armor too, but if you want to avoid doing that too much, then just level Endurance up to 30 and you should be good for dual wielding most items. Be sure to level up Dexterity as well to increase your casting speed and consider capping it off at 40 whenever you feel like everything else is leveled up good enough since using the Redagon's Icon Talisman speeds up casting to the equivalent of 30 Dexterity points and casting speed is capped at 70 Dexterity. For my build recommendations, you'll generally want to use the Carrion Regal Scepter Staff with Redagon's Icon as well as the Graven Mass Talisman, Godfrey's Icon, and the Carrion Filigreed Crest. If you want to play as a badass samurai, or glitter bomb your foes, then stick with the Moonveil Katana or the Wing of Astal. Both of these weapons are great fun options for most of your gameplay, especially when it's coupled with the Misericord Dagger for using Bloodhound Step and getting critical attacks in. If you want to be a super super saiyan, then feel free to trade out the Radagon Icon with the Graven School Talisman and equip the Azure Helmet while dual wielding the Azure and Lusat Staffs to get additional damage buffs for your big Kamehameha move. Don't forget to use the Terra Magicka spell with the Cerulean Hidden and the Magic Shrouding Crack tiers in your Flask of Wondrous Physic to max out your damage as much as possible too. If you're like me and enjoy using Adola's Moonblade, then you may want to consider being a Frost Spellblade by using the Dark Moon Greatsword with the Snow Witch Hat to deal out additional frost damage. This is even better with the Godfrey Icon Talisman equipped since its boost to charge attacks also applies to the Greatsword's special ranged attack too. You'll lose the coating on the weapon if you swap it out at all though, so be sure to get good at dodging or use the Jellyfish Shield instead of the Bloodhound Step Ash War. If you want to try a Sleep Assassin build, then use the Sword of St. Trina and the Misericord Dagger with the Assassin Cerulean Dagger and Dagger Talismans to get critical attacks in after quickly getting them to fall asleep with the Sword's special attack. Talismans will help deal extra damage with the Crit Dagger while replenishing FP for each critical hit. You will want to run a shield with this build though in order to keep the sleep coating on the sword since it could be lost as soon as you take damage or swap out the weapon. Overall this should definitely help you get powered up enough to finish the mid and end game for Elden Ring, but please let me know in the comments below if you'd like to see me cover any other weapons, spells, or items I may have missed. And if you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe as I continue to cover more end game content for Elden Ring. And as always, feel free to follow my socials using the description below to keep in touch, but until next time, happy gaming!